you know, we read about in the scriptures where certain uh, certain brothers are going to be beheaded, man. Imagine that. You know, you're brought to a government building, and right before you is this shining, gleaming guillotine. And they're telling you they're going to chop your head off if you don't take that chip. What are you going to do, man? Who are you going to trust in then? Who's going to comfort you then? There ain't no brothers around. You can't go to no videos. <laughs> So that's why you got to have within yourself, and I keep saying you, that's why we got to have within ourselves the basic belief in Yahweh Bashim Yahushai. The basic belief that no matter what adversity we go into, Yahweh Bashim Yahushai will deliver us. Maybe five, six, seven years ago, I heard a phenomenal testimony on YouTube about two U.S. soldiers that got murdered. Basically, they were down in a basement in a military base, and they went into a room that they were not authorized to go into. You know, it's kind of like they were just snooping around. They went into this large room, and they, what they found was modern-day guillotines. And they freaked out, and they started telling people. And within, I don't know, a short period of time, they both wound up dead. And that story got onto the internet. I clearly remember it. But their shocking story is not the only one talking about military bases and guillotines. Why are modern guillotines on military bases throughout North America? Hmm. Maybe because they plan on killing us. This story comes from a Christian truck driver that delivered a shipment, he happened to look inside of his semi-trailer and probably got the shock of his life. He was delivering modern-day guillotines to a marine base in Billings, Montana. There is no doubt in my mind that guillotines are being stored in selected military bases. In fact, I absolutely believe that one out of ten U.S. soldiers are wicked, murdering criminals that would have no problem with murdering you and me and the guy down the street. They would have no problem. And there's even bizarre stories about prisoner boxcars, rail cars that have shackles already built into the floors of the boxcars. I do know this, if you get left behind the rapture and you're taken to a FEMA facility or UN soldiers come and take you, don't fear. Say your prayers, get as close to God as you can, and maybe you can be so filled with the Spirit of God that you can smile while they chop your head off. Wouldn't that be the greatest way to die or leave this earth? To smile as they chop your freaking head off. Because when you study up on the Bible and what it has to say about Babylon the Great and the end result of Babylon the Great, and then Hollywood actually puts in their movies the future of America and how they seem to unpleasantly line up. I mean, if you have not seen this movie, you have to watch this movie. We know that America is Babylon the Great, okay? It clearly says she's surrounded by many waters, okay? America is surrounded by many waters. Rome is not surrounded by many waters. The Bible also says that great city Babylon, the great merchants of the earth, will stand afar off in fear and horror at her destruction and all that. Well, guess what? The great merchants of the earth could not go to Rome if their life depended on it because Rome does not have a deep port harbor. Okay, it's talking about New York City, that great city Babylon, where the kings of the earth meet. Well, the UN headquarters just happens to be in New York City. It's talking about New York City or America. The history of guillotines. Once dubbed the National Razor of France for its frequent employment during the French Revolution, the guillotine was first proposed by Dr. Joseph Ignace Guillotin as a gentler means of execution, since beheadings by swords and axes were frequently botched and unnecessarily and quite painfully protracted. 
The French guillotine was most likely inspired by a middle-aged beheading device called the Planky, which was used in Germany and Flanders, followed by an Italian Renaissance-era device called a Manna, or Scottish Maiden, which took the lives of 120 people between the 16th and 18th centuries. During the Reign of Terror in mid-1790s France, scores of enemies of the French Revolution met their end beneath the blade of a guillotine where the morbidly curious flocked to the Place de la Bastille to enjoy a day's conga line of executions. Spectators bought souvenirs or programs listing the day's victims, often grabbing a quick bite to eat at a nearby restaurant called Cabaret de la Guillotine. One famous group of ladies known as the Tricoteurs sat beside the scaffold on a regular basis, knitting between executions, while many of the condemned themselves offered quips or defiant last words as they approached the scaffold, some even dancing their way up the steps to their final demise. As the popularity of the guillotine grew in France, so did the notoriety and fame of her executioners, who were judged on precision and speed during a day's assembly line of executions. Multiple generations of the Sansom family served as state executioners from 1792 to 1846, reaching rock star status after dropping the blade on Louis XVI, Marie Antoinette, and thousands of lesser known victims. Other big names during 19th and 20th century France was father and son headsman Louis and Anatoly Dibler, whose flair for their choice of clothing on the scaffold frequently inspired widespread fashion trends. Many gangsters and criminals of the time sported tattoos bearing such phrases as my head goes to Dibler. Nor were guillotines left to the exclusive use by Frenchmen, for when Adolf Hitler rose to power in 1930s Germany, he ordered the distribution of 20 guillotines into key cities across the country, which in turn claimed the lives of some 16,500 resistance fighters and political dissidents between 1933 and 1945. Yet long after the guillotine fell from use in Nazi Germany, the guillotine remained France's capital punishment instrument of choice well into the 20th century, taking its last victim in 1977, when a final blade dropped on convicted murderer Hamida Jandobi. Four years later, France officially abolished capital punishment from their penal code ending 189 years of state-sponsored entertainment and blatant inhumanity. And there you have it, the history of guillotines, today in The Daily Dose. Get your nerd on with The Daily Dose. Pamela Schubert reporting from North Carolina. I was riding on a bus from Butte, Montana to North Carolina, when I met a young man all dressed up in full and impressive Army Ranger uniform. He carried his 445 mag gun and many knives and several phones and military backpack and other equipment. He told me he was a staff sergeant from Fort Lewis. Fort Lewis is where many modern yachtings have been stored for a long time, for use in martial law. I teased him at first and told him I knew all about the modern yachtings in Fort Lewis. He was shocked. He said, how did you know? This is highly classified information. I told him that the US military was not telling the young men like him, but these guillotines will be used on Americans and Christians in the future under martial law to behead all new world order resistors. The longer he listened, the angrier he got. Using a few choice expletives, he said, they never told us this would be used on Americans under martial law to get rid of all Christians and New World Order resistors. We thought they would be used in Iraq or something. He then asked me to tell him more and more. Finally.
know, we read about in the scriptures where certain uh, certain brothers are going to be beheaded, man. Imagine that. You know, you're brought to a government building, and right before you is this shining, gleaming guillotine. And they're telling you they're going to chop your head off if you don't take that chip. What are you going to do, man? Who are you going to trust in then? Who's going to comfort you? Devil's around. You can't go to no videos. <laughs> So that's why you got to have within yourself, and I keep saying you, that's why we got to have within ourselves the basic belief in Yahweh Bashim Yahushai. The basic belief that no matter what adversity we go into, Yahweh Bashim Yahushai will deliver us. This is what we got to have. That, that's the kind of faith you got to have. Okay? And, and if you know deep within your heart you've been doing what Yahweh Bashim Yahushai said to do, you've been going out there on the streets and teaching because you're able body, you've been. Uh, uh, doing your videos, you made a conscious effort to edify the brotherhood in sincerity and truth, then just know, no matter what you go through, Yahweh Hashem Yahshai will be with you and deliver you, man. And I'm telling you this because the moment will present itself when you're in a predictable, uh, uh, predictable situation, okay, a very dire situation between you and the so-called government agents. And the only thing that's going to deliver you is the faith that you have between you and Yahweh Hashem Yahushai at that moment. That would be like your, your, your darkest hour, okay? And even Yahweh Shai, he had his darkest hour, okay? And you see, you see what happened there, all right? He trusted in Yahweh Hashem Yahushai. I'm sorry, he trusted in his father Yahweh to the very end when he was on the cross. There was a moment when he thought the father forsook, forsook him, but did the father forsook, forsook him? Hell no, because just like the father promised on the, on the fourth day, which after three days, the father raised him up from the grave and gave him his glory. And now he sits at the right-hand side of the father, as it is written. Well, guess what, brothers? As it is written, we are joint heirs with Yahweh Shai. So after we suffer, we're going to receive the glory. 